was important to the Hunt family and to Major League Soccer that the crew remain in Columbus. Uh, so we're very committed to that. We're excited to be here. They are considering moving the crew to Austin. I see a vision of uh, Major League Soccer being very, very successful here in Austin. Columbus Crew SC is one of the original franchises of Major League Soccer, but the team's future here in Columbus now stands in jeopardy. England to Brazil. Sunday morning, and that means it's time to talk the beautiful game right here on the throw in 1049 AM 1260, streaming worldwide on hornfm.com. I'm your host, Kit McConico, joined as always by the Smash Simmons. Is there going to be an MLS team moving from Columbus to Austin? We don't know. Pre court, he needs to get his stuff together, as does the city of Austin. Precourt had his preferred site to build a new crew stadium, but it was on a patch of land in Austin known as Macala Place. Columbus fans derided it as the site of an old toxic waste dump, but having been cleaned up, it now had a lot going for it as a potential MLS site, and Austin soccer advocates decided to get a first look. Right about where we are here is probably where midfield of the stadium would be. So this is it. This is my first time out here, Andrew. It is a toxic waste land. <laughs> it used to be. It used to be. Uh, it's, it's cleaned up and just waiting to be used now. This is basically the center of Austin, population-wise, between north, south, east, and west. So if you want a stadium that's really in the center, that has access to one, two, three different major highways, it's an amazing site, actually. If you can look at it from the idea of what it can be, as yeah. opposed to what it is, that's it's the beauty of what's possible here. I think going out for some games is gonna be pretty legit. I'm gonna have to take some time off. <laughs> Soccer or work? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Soccer is work. It, it, <laughs> it's the most passionate work. Soccer's life. While the whole project had come as a shock in Columbus, Austin soccer fans, had deduced long in advance that something was in the works, thanks to some detective work by the leader of the biggest MLS supporter group in Austin. February 21st, 2017, we posted an article um, via Columbus, Ohio, which essentially laid out the potential for uh, a team to maybe relocate to Austin versus uh, expansion, which was our initial goal. Um, and that came about because um, the league had set up an expansion process, which became the 12 expansion candidate teams. Austin was not in that list. We didn't have a local owner, yet Austin kept being mentioned in, in the league rounds and name dropped by Don Garber. And so we were like, okay, well, clearly there's still interest in Austin, but we're not one of the 12 candidates. It only leaves you with one other conclusion of how do you get a team moving one here. If Precourt was to succeed in his efforts, it would be necessary to convince the mayor and the Austin City Council to grant him use of McCullough Place. While some council members embraced the idea from the start, others were far more skeptical. And the first face-to-face -face meeting with one in particular couldn't have gone any worse. I was on pretty much red alert at that point. The thing is, is they weren't telling me anything. They wanted, they wanted to charm me. Um, which was not going to be possible. They don't strike me as the kind of people who would understand how to do that. So if Austin's council members were not immediately won over, what was motivating Precourt to push for it? It turns out that when Precourt bought the crew in 2013, a clause had been secretly inserted into the deal that allowed a move to Austin, the largest city in the U.S. without any other professional sports teams as competition and that wasn't all. Setting up an MLS team from scratch in Austin would require Precourt to pay the league a $150 million expansion fee. Although he had paid an MLS record price back in 2013, Precourt bought the crew for only $68 million. The difference between that price and the normal expansion fee was therefore giving Precourt 82 million reasons to move the team.
The annual Supporters Summit in Columbus would provide fans with their first face-to-face -face meeting with the team front office in the four months since learning of the Austin Project. Precourt and the league had spoken of pursuing parallel paths, claiming to be working just as hard in Columbus as in Austin, but supporters were not seeing any evidence of this. With neither Precourt nor Greeley willing to show their faces, tonight it would be left to the team's president of business operations, Andy Lochnane, to face the music. We're heading into the Supporters Summit. It's our first time to really be in front of anyone from the front office since the announcement. We're hoping um, to be a productive and useful conversation. For the most part, I think we really want to know uh, what we can do to help. At the end of the day, I hope it stays civil and we get some good ideas on how to move forward and it's going to be beneficial for the fans and from the front office. So, hope it goes well. Uh, yeah, we'll see what's going to happen. I think it's going to be them talking about their narrative of parallel paths, which is kind of bullshit, but we'll find out. Cameras were barred, and as expected, some of the exchanges would prove less than pleasant. What? What can we do? I, it, this, that's pretty much why everyone's here. What can we do? In order to build a stadium, you have to have what's called contractually obligated income, COI. No bank will lend, will finance construction of a project unless there is the right amount of contractually obligated income. What if your trust fund baby had the money for it? Everybody in this room loves the club. But at the end of the day, we do need corporate support to survive. Right now, we cannot borrow money based on our cash operations. We cannot borrow more than a couple million dollars from the bank, let alone $175 million based on our operations. It appeared that Precourt's ownership group were pleading poverty. But how much of Precourt's own money had been invested in the crew? I would be surprised if his total outlay was more than a million dollars into a stadium that was already approaching antiquity. And if this was supposed to make crew fans understand the predicament, it didn't exactly tally with the noises Precourt was making in Texas. We will privately finance the building of a new stadium here in Austin. Uh, there will be no public tax dollars used. So if that was on the table in Austin, what had Donnie Murray heard about Precourt and Greeley's parallel path in Columbus? I still haven't gotten a call from Dave Greeley, so waiting for that. Same with everybody else on Save the Crew. Uh, there's really not a whole lot they've been doing in Columbus. You know, I think the parallel paths is a fancy buzz term for them. But really, at the end of the day, they've been doing the bare minimum in Columbus just to keep the lights on. If Precourt and company were truly making an effort, it didn't seem to be working. For all outward appearances, it looked as though the Columbus crew were being left to die on the vine. Fans started to complain of a lack of advertising, even a lack of stadium maintenance, and combined with the notion that the team may cease to exist, it meant that average attendance had already plunged by 20%. The hardcore supporters in the stadium's famous corner known as the Nordeck continued to show. One regular fan tried to sum up the city's struggle of supporting the team without simultaneously funding its own demise. Oh! oh! Obviously you want to be here, but the biggest villain in your life right now owns this place. And I mean, I bought my season ticket, but you know, shelling over you know, $400 to a person that I cannot stand right now it was a tough thing to do, but ultimately, I'm not going to let him rob me. If this is the last year, and I pray that it's not, but if it is, I'm going to take in every moment that I have. I'm not going to let Anthony Precourt rob me of a second of this. When, when the news broke that night, you know, I called my girlfriend at the time and obviously explained, like, and I was very upset. And I said, you know, this apparently our owner is looking to move the crew and. And I, I was keeping it together until I, I mentioned that I really was, I, it's something I never really thought about too much until that, that time, but I, I realized I would never be able to bring my children uh, to the match. And you know, that's a tough thing, that's a tough pill to swallow when, when that, that realization kind of hits you that 
And this may not be around here in the future. And something that I held so dear to myself may not be available to my kids. Even for those who turned out every week, it was becoming increasingly difficult to focus on the game. We all knew where our money was going. It wasn't going into investing in the stadium, which we saw falling apart all season. It wasn't to, to investing in advertising for this team to, to make sure people were coming out to games. It was going to pay for those green and black scarves and hats and shirts down in Austin, Texas, where crew fans are here paying $30 for a t-shirt at the team store. And that's one thing that's really made me angry. Faced with this dilemma, Save the Crew decided to create a shirt of their own to show support remained while raising money for their cause. The shirt came together as an idea that actually one of our supporters kind of threw out uh, on the internet. You know, we don't come up with all the ideas as a small little team. Everybody's always helping. We didn't want to throw together a cheap jersey, slap Save the Crew on it. Uh, so we really wanted to, to have something that people could be proud to wear and something that showed uh, community support. Community support appeared to be less of a problem in Austin. Fans were able to toast the crucial role that a big league soccer team may play in unifying a city so attractive that the population had doubled in less than a generation. We come together for the UT games. We come together to tailgate and have a good time with those, but that's six, seven games a year. Soccer, few, few and far between. Soccer is a year-round sport. Period, the end, it's a year-round sport. Uh, it's a sport that can bring the city together because you know what? Every person that lives in this town, they all support a different American football team. Hell, they all support a different English team. <laughs> they all support a different basketball team. We don't have anything that brings us as Austinites together. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing from an Austinite to think about, having something where we're not separated. We're all together on that. But there was a moral question that needed to be addressed. How could fans in Austin support something that brought them together at the cost of a soccer community that already was together elsewhere. In 1996, a team was given to them, you know? Mm. And I don't see it too much different that if a team just falls into my lap. The town doesn't want it. If the town is as big as, you know, they put it out to be, they wouldn't be leaving. The crew has been there for 22 years. If you do not have a stable support group, a stable uh, 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 stream of viewers, a stable stream of people going to the game, then you're doing something wrong or the town doesn't want it. No good businessman is ever gonna leave a town that's gonna bring them money. The only reason he wants to leave is because there's not enough support. And I feel for them, I really do, but it's a little too little too late. The unapologetic rhetoric coming from Texas made crew supporters angry. But was that anger born of the knowledge that deep down it contained more than a grain of truth? You can argue that, and I've argued that more than twice or two times since this all started. As a matter of fact, the first column I wrote on the subject for the October 18th newspaper said, Freeport may be a lot of things, and I named a lot of things. Um, in the second paragraph was, but he has a point. Hardcore supporters were not the problem. The city itself stood accused of ambivalence toward its soccer team, focused instead on Ohio State College football, pro hockey, and pro baseball that would not be competition to a team in Austin. I would describe the city's view of Precord and the crew prior to uh, his announcement as um, neglectful is too strong a word, but not worried enough would probably be a proper way to describe it. If city leaders had been asleep before, Precourt had certainly woken them up. And the Save the Crew movement looked to harness their support. This morning we have a guest with us, Mr. Morgan Hughes, hashtag Save the Crew campaign. It's nice to see the, the scarves around the necks of so many of you today. We, uh, we try to keep in mind that the way that we communicate our message 
is as important as the message itself. While pre-court retained the best lobbyists money could buy in Texas, Cruz supporters were left to lobby public offices across Columbus without any assistance of any kind from the club. Uh, Madam President, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, thank you for uh, taking a moment to listen to me today. Uh, because as many of you know, the current investor operator of the Columbus Crew is considering moving the team to Austin, Texas. 18, a resolution to urge the investor, operator, and chairman of Columbus Crew Soccer Club to keep the franchise in Columbus and forgo re relocation efforts. Mr. Schmidt, your sponsor. Okay, yeah, I'm a sponsor. I'll show my solidarity here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> While they were able to secure motions of support from local civic leaders, these were nothing more than ceremonial, and it would take far more than this to deter pre-court and MLS from moving the team. The lack of corporate support mentioned by Andy Lochnane was being addressed behind the scenes. Within months, Save the Crew had built a roster of over 300 local and national companies willing to throw their weight behind the movement. The team had stood accused of performing poorly in its business metrics for years before pre-court was ever involved. Most notably, in season ticket sales, which had fallen far below the magic number of 10,000 per season. This is an important number in crew history because we were established as the first team based on an initial pledge of 10,000 season tickets in Columbus. MLS Commissioner Don Garber had been accused by some of blindsiding Columbus. But in previous years, he had visited the city specifically to help restore the crew to its former glory. We need to grow that fan base back to the first 10,000 season ticket base we've ever had. The crew held that record until 2007 because this team matters. And if we could have it matter even more, it'll be great for the city. And even Anthony Precourt himself recognized that a team support was built on a stable season ticket base. Hi, crew fans. This is Anthony Precourt, the new chairman of your Columbus crew. As we embark on this exciting new era in Columbus, I hope that you will continue your support for the club so we can close in on our goal of 10,000 season tickets. Taking the hint, Save the Crew decided to take on the challenge themselves. They created The Pledge a drive to establish their own base of fans who would buy season tickets under a new ownership for 2019, if the crew remained in town as an MLS club. So when we launched the season ticket pledge, it only took us a few months, we had 10,000 season ticket pledges. We're super excited to turn over our list of pledges to the next owner of the team. So if it was supposedly this easy, why had previous owners failed? The crew was founded by U.S. sports magnate Lamar Hunt. And although he was revered in Columbus, he was based in Texas. After his death, his family were ambivalent toward the team until selling to Anthony Precourt, who was based even further away in California. His first press conference, uh, another, a colleague of mine, another columnist at the Columbus Dispatch, was already hitting the, the button, of the alarm button, um, I went back and looked at that column, and uh, it was, this guy, is, it's another out-of-town owner. I do live in Northern California. We decided to get to know Columbus better. I'll be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time here. For Save the Crew leaders, the root cause of the team's economic problems were becoming clear. Not having a local owner here, and not having someone really dedicated to the community. They're not as connected to the local business community as they should be, uh, whether that's because they're an outside investor, or they haven't spent the time, you know, boots on the ground, getting to know the major players in town. I think that's part of it as well. All these behind the scenes movements were important, but they weren't exactly headline grabbing. And as Columbus moved into the dog days of summer, the Save the Crew message started to encounter another problem, compassion fatigue. 
It was always going to be easier in the first moments because that's when the wound is the freshest. As it goes on and you become number to it, it becomes kind of your reality. The podcasts, the national podcasts aren't calling as much and they don't want you back on the BBC to talk about it again. And you know, you've, you've done your ESPN articles and you've been on the national newscasts. And uh, I, we all knew that it, that was gonna be the time when, when, it, was, when it was most important and most difficult. To, to keep awareness of it. To capture the imagination of the public, something more exciting would be necessary. And luckily, the movement had attracted the kind of volunteers they needed. Fortunately, we had a few people that were like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm an architect. And these kind of people all just coming out and saying, I have these talents, how can I help, what can I do? And you know, ultimately for someone like me, I'm a city planner. <laughs> You know, what's a city planner going to do in, in saving a soccer team? And it turns out something like this is right up my alley. Having been told from the start that the team was moving unless a stadium plan was forthcoming from the city, the Save the Crew movement decided to go for the big one. I was one of the ones that was an advocate for uh, doing a stadium. Uh, initially, we kind of thought that was beyond our scope. Um, you know, it's a big project, right? And, and we are a team of volunteers. We. Uh, initially, it kind of suggested it, and we're like, okay, well, we need to see if we can find somebody that's, that's got the software, that's got the skill set, and has the time to, to get started on this. We had a team of probably 10 to 12 people that worked pretty consistently on this, um, and it, it took us a while. It was, it was several months of work and a lot of time dedicated from some pretty you know, great fans and volunteers. With David Faust and the Save the Crew engineers working on a grand project, the crew's future generation of fans would be stepping up on game nights. The, soccer tournament Dayton? the, no, no, the, one that the crew community yeah. consists of fans of all ages. Some of the most well-known faces in the Nordeck are the young group who call themselves the Hive. The queen of this hive is Kennedy Cry, better known as Kruby, who attends every crew home game along with her dad, John. Okay, so this is our banner that we're doing for Eddie Apoku. For Eddie Apoku because he's like our group favorite player. And it's his first game today. Yeah, and today's his first game. Mm -hmm. He comes from Ghana, that which they don't have a very good like me, backstory, I guess. Yeah. Because they don't have much stuff. They and he actually. Shoes. Yeah, Ellie's like, they don't have shoes? <laughs> <laughs> they don't have shoes. And they were playing on the gravel with no shoes at all. Because yeah. I'm the fashion forward. Yeah, <laughs> she loves her fashion. Turned out really good. I like that. You guys did good. What do you think, girls? Columbus, 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 Tonight is a big night for Crew B, and not only will her favorite player be making his debut, but she will also be working as a capo, the fan who leads the supporter chants. The game is heading for extra time, but as full time approaches, the Hive lead a crew stadium tradition. When the crew tie the game in extra time to take it to penalty kicks, it transpires that this is one hive that doesn't enjoy smoke.
it would be left to their favorite player, Eddie Opoku, to take one of the sudden death penalty kicks. It's tied, guys, it's tied. I don't want to look. I really want to win. It's tied, okay, you ready? Eddie's one of the last ones. Eddie's one of the last ones. After such a memorable night, the prospect of losing the crew, a centerpiece of their existence, can't even be contemplated. You know, this is this is definitely our bonding thing, and it's where I see her get to really just open up. You know, one of the things is is, is the the crew bee that everybody sees here isn't necessarily the Kennedy in every other part of her life. And I've asked her before, you know, like, what is it that's different about this that lets you be so open? Tell them, what was your because, answer? Because crew, all these crew fans out here aren't just like friends. They're family. They treat us like family. So she They're said, like, Molly, yeah, so she Mama. said she's not embarrassed around family. And yeah. She feels like she can just have fun and not open. worry about what anybody thinks. Yeah. So I think it'd be very difficult for us to find that place where we can get, yeah. you know, just these random people that I don't know anything else about their lives at all. All I know is they <laughs> like the same team as us and we come here, we have a great time and, mm -hmm. you know, we meet wonderful people. But the crew were still seeing sparse crowds. While in another Ohio city, a new team had sprung up that was playing to a full house. After two decades as the figurehead of Ohio soccer, the crew now faced a challenge from new boys FC Cincinnati. Playing one league below the crew, they had been a huge success since their startup in late 2015 and were just one season away from reaching MLS. While the locals fully embraced the club from the beginning, even they were surprised by the Sun's success. Kind of randomly, uh, end of 2015, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, FC Cincinnati gets announced uh, playing in the USL, which is kind of like an up and coming league. People just kind of went nuts for it. Uh, they announced they were playing in Nippert Stadium, which I think a lot of people were skeptical about. If they could fill it, maybe even get 10,000 here on occasion. And that first game, 14,000 people showed up, and people just kept coming back every weekend after that. Who watches soccer in Cincinnati? Turns out a lot of people. I came with the assumption that we would immediately be singing songs that we all knew somehow. I don't know why I thought that, but I took the game in over there. I look over to this section, smoke going off, flags and whatnot. Um, and at one point in the game, I don't remember when it was, the entire crowd just FCC, FCC, FCC. <laughs> The two Ohio teams met for the first time in the 2017 U.S. Open Cup, and an infamous local billboard on the freeway that connects the two cities would become the unofficial name of the Ohio Derby. When it was announced that we would be playing them during the Open Cup, there was so much excitement. Kind of from day one, it was like, oh, wouldn't it be crazy if one day we played the crew? And like, then it happened. But that week, when we were playing the crew, like like you said, people were just so excited about it. Nervous. How many freaking news stories were done? How many times were they asking for people to come to the stadium at six in the morning and talk about, what does it mean if we beat the crew? What do you think if we beat the crew? You it's a, that yeah. It. <laughs> and it was just like, it was like, it was like the whole FC Cincinnati story was born again. We had a ton of crew fans there. It was, it was a great atmosphere. Well, FC Cincinnati able to keep it alive. Point gets swinging across. Jimmy gets his head on it, straight up into the air. Jimmy again, and Jimmy has done it. His third Open Cup goal, and FC Cincinnati has the lead. David has slain Goliath at Nipper Stadium. FC Cincinnati wins the first ever Ohio Derby. 
FC Cincinnati's instant success would give Columbus a genuine local rivalry. But supporters of both clubs started to wonder out loud if Cincinnati were not so much rivals, but replacements. You could see a scenario where Major League Soccer tells Columbus fans, hey, we're going to take your team to Austin, but we're going to bring soccer back to the state in Cincinnati. It kind of started justifying some of the tinfoil hat theories we had. Like, were we the destined replacement for them? Then it's, it felt pretty shitty for a long time that we were kind of a pawn used in that yeah. MLS chess game. But FCC fans didn't just leave it there. Dozens of FC Cincinnati fans traveling to Columbus, not just to watch two teams play. This was a show of support. FCC fans are now playing a key role, rooting for their rivals off the field. Keep hell real. Keep it real, as real as you can get. Meanwhile, the MLS to ATX movement continued to pursue Austin despite the existence of two other MLS clubs in Texas. If supporting a team in another city was now unacceptable to Austin soccer fans, it was hypocritical in the extreme to suggest crew fans should do likewise. All right, you have three minutes, sir. Okay. Columbus isn't exactly being, being left. Uh, Cincinnati, an hour and a half south of them, they're having a brand new sports stadium built for MLS, so that's an alternative for them. So they're not being completely left in the dark. Uh, why don't you just go like something else? Why don't you go like something else? Why don't you go like something else? My community exists already. You don't need to participate in an AstroTurf campaign to destroy my community in order to get a soccer team. The crew community remained defiant, but the custodian of their club was still making it clear which of the parallel paths he was taking. Good morning. Um, my name is Anthony Precourt. It's been an honor to bring the vision of Major League Soccer to this great city of Austin, Texas. It is important for us um, to bring this, this city a uh, Major League Soccer team. Um, Wherever he went from here, it was clear there was no path back to Columbus. A warm summer evening always guarantees a good turnout at Crew Stadium. But the upcoming game would be special. Iraqi national team player Justin Mira spent six years as a crew regular, but was traded soon after the Austin uncertainty began. After just six months, he's decided to return to the community where he was loved, and his entire family have made the trip too. We're really excited to be back here in Columbus. Uh, it's bittersweet that Justin left and now he's back and, and we were so excited and the first game back had the whole family get out here and got the RV all packed up. The Save the Crew TIFO team have laid out a very special welcome mat. Miriam would be on the bench, but the Nordek weren't going to wait. Let's go, J9! Dude, that thing is huge. The family snapped pictures for posterity as they eased back into familiar surroundings. Any time I go to lunch with my uncle and I like stay with him and go to the locker room with him, they've never lost the game. Every time I've done that, they because you couldn't. If they, if they don't win today, you're the jinx. We're not gonna let you come back. Save the crew. Save the crew. Save the crew. Save the crew. Do you think they will save the crew? I hope so. Okay. Save the crew. Save the crew. Save the crew. Save the crew. As fans get up for halftime refreshments, the Mirams find themselves being recognized by some old friends in the stands. Yeah. Oh, wow. I was standing either in front of you or behind you, I don't remember, at a concession, at the concession booth. Yeah. And I took one look at you and Francis, and I You're was like, like are you Justin's from? brothers? <laughs> Ever since that road game, we've been friends. Yeah. 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 
Nope. Sorry, right, you're a lifer, we're a lifer. Absolutely. And that's what I was telling your dad. Like, this is what it's all about, yeah. right? This is what we fight for. With no score in the second half, fans start to chant for their returning hero. Final touch on the sideline, and here's the sub on the hour mark. He joked yesterday, I enjoyed my six month loan spell, but it's good to be home. Welcome back, Justin Merrill. Family and friends in attendance, he says it's great to be back home. Let's go, great! 37 goals, 33 assists in the black and gold. Knows enough of this system, can they have an impact? In the final minute, crew fans got their answer. Sporting it left, Artur. Awful. Mullins, oh started! Yeah! 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 They leave it late again. But this one is the haymaker, and a final score of one nothing in Columbus. Thank you. We're happy to be home. It's been a triumphant night, one of the largest crowds of the year, a last-minute winner, and the return of a well-loved family. The post-game party atmosphere spills out into the tailgate. For once, it's an evening when crew fans are able to just kick back and enjoy themselves. And it only gets better when there's a curtain call from the star player himself. J9 is back! Yay! Woo! He is the piece that possibly we need to feel that wholeness, mm -hmm. you know? We have so many things going on to make us feel like we're losing bits and pieces of the crew, but he really is part of that wholeness of our of our team and of our fan base. It's a symbolism, right? Like we're, we're family. That like means we're not something. Related, but we're family because of crew. Uh -huh. And now Justin Maram's family is here too. But I'm crying. I'll stop. <laughs> Every fan that we walk by, I mean, from the second we got here, we're so thankful that you guys are back. We're thankful that Justin's back. We're just happy to be home. <laughs> really. The mood was now more upbeat. But although crew fans had bombarded the Austin City Council with messages, there still appeared no direct way of influencing events in Texas. Little did anyone realize how quickly that would change. It was a Sunday afternoon and uh, I got a text message from a 512 number. When Morgan Hughes checked that text message, he was startled by the identity of the person who had sent it. A priceless opportunity for direct contact with Austin city leaders now presented itself. Hey Morgan, this is Leslie Poole. I was hoping we could chat. Okay, when are you thinking? She's like, well, I'm at the airport right now. I bought the plane ticket. I made the decision pretty quickly on Saturday night and flew out Sunday morning. Morgan Hughes came to pick me up late in the afternoon around five o'clock and um, he drove me out to the bar where the uh, Save the Crew crowd meets on Monday night. Meeting started and, uh, and she was just there to, to listen. Away from the cameras, Council Member Poole listened at length as Save the Crew leaders outlined their five years of dealing with Anthony Precourt as the custodian of their club and their experiences since discovering his double dealing in Austin. If there's one place that should know what it's like to do business with Anthony Precourt, it, 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 it should be Columbus. And if we were going to be entering into a partnership with him, I needed to understand um, how, he would, how he would operate. 
Poole's visit was a huge political coup for Save the Crew. But in Poole's home district in Austin, MLS to ATX supporters were up in arms. We were surprised and disappointed that she chose to go to Columbus to talk to fans there rather than engage the fans that are in her district and in the rest of Austin. I mean, it's, we don't understand why she would do that. Well, I find it disappointing that you know she would travel to Columbus to get that perspective, yet ignore that here at home. It, it makes you, you know, it just makes you question her motivations. Austin supporters were not going to let her off the hook. In a heated debate upon her return, they let her know, in no uncertain terms, what they thought of her. Council Member Poole, Austinites are tired of your stall tactics, and we know that you will never vote yes to bringing a city into your district. And if you want to argue this claim, know that whatever your intentions are, this is the message you have sent us. By and large, the people who weighed in on social media and claimed that I wasn't listening to them, um, I was. But mostly I didn't hear anything from them except for, get out of our way, we want this team. Thank you. But the defiance of the fans was not reflected by Precourt's team. A previous statement had already shown increasing concern that the Save the Crew campaign could derail the plans in Austin. For the most senior sports writer in Columbus, Save the Crew were delivering the comeuppance that Precourt deserved. It's a knife fight now, and they're about to unsheath a couple of their own. And good on them, because to me, it's, uh, it's repugnant, it's morally reprehensible. It seems without feeling at all. It's, there's an utter lack of empathy involved in everything they're doing. And I'm tired of it's just business. This is our city, and uh, part of my job is to look after my city. And uh, I'm really, I've really been uh, quite moved by the Save the Crew movement. Even as a jaded old sports writer with 35 years in the business, it's been remarkable. And I'm behind them 100% because what's happening here is wrong and they stand for all the right things. If this was a knife fight to prove Columbus could still be a top-line soccer city, then Save the Crew were about to draw their sharpest blade yet. If they build it, will they come? And the bigger question, will the Columbus crew even be around to lure fans to a new stadium being proposed by the grassroots group known as Save the Crew? Although it held historic significance as the first purpose-built MLS venue, Crew Stadium had long since fallen behind the times. While Anthony Precourt appeared disinterested in Columbus, it was time for crew fans to show what the city could really do. We heard all this talk about parallel paths from the beginning of this, but we never saw our side of the path. So say the crew's thought with this was that we need to be paving our own side of the path. And so they did locating the perfect patch of land within the downtown core upon which they could propose a stadium that could propel the crew into a new era. So here we are. Right now, it's a bunch of rubble, dirt, grass. Just imagine if all of this stuff is being cleared to make way for a new 22, 24,000 seat stadium right here in downtown. What they had created was not just merely a sketch of what could be, but a fully functioning complex. The centerpiece was a 23,000 seat stadium with a roof inspired by the arches of the historic Short North District and one end open to provide a spectacular backdrop. We've got the skyline behind us with some of the biggest buildings in the city lit up in gold. An expanded Nordeck would raise the noise to new levels, but the style was more than backed up by the substance. Included with the proposal were plans to handle traffic flow, parking, public transport, sustainability, and a green space. Frankly, a group of volunteers doing this in their extra spare time 
just from the passion that they have for this team, being able to accomplish what we've accomplished is really, it says a lot. Save the Crew had created the entire project without the club's assistance. If this was what Columbus could do on its own, how far could it go if the club's ownership and the league were with them? We've all been wanting this for a long time. I see it, and thousands of others see it as well. And I just can't wait for it to happen. Across the better part of 12 months, Columbus had stood accused of lacking fan support, local business support, support from city leaders, and the willingness to create a facility to take the crew into the 21st century. However daunting it had first appeared, Save the Crew had taken on the challenge of refuting those narratives and come up with answers to all of them. One thing that hasn't changed though in all this time is the support that the community, the fans, the people here in Columbus have shown for the team. People outside of Columbus probably were mistaken in thinking that there wasn't a lot of support for the team here. They're wrong. The pregame tailgates continued and crew fans continue to stay positive as decision day on pre-court's proposal in Austin loom large on the horizon. But after almost a year of unpaid volunteer work, the Save the Crew leadership were starting to tire. It would be nice to just, you know, be able to be a fan again. And um, we sometimes joke at the leadership meetings among the supporters group leaders that you know, it'd be nice to just go back to be a fan again and think of the fun stuff. I work a full-time job. Sometimes this this has felt like a second full-time job, you know, where I'm doing things on, on weekends and doing things multiple times during the evenings. And, you know, sometimes I just want to sit on my couch and watch some TV. It's one thing to tell them that it's not over and to tell everyone you know in the first week, but then in, you know, month eight, it's, di it's more difficult because, you know, it's human nature to go like, <sighs> it's, I mean, like, how long are we gonna have to do this? For the movement's creative director, there was an acceptance that their best efforts may still not be good enough. We are probably closer to the end than the beginning. I would certainly hope we're closer to the end than the beginning. Regardless of how sure and confident we feel, there's always a chance that we may not succeed. And I think even in that instance, I think that I'm proud of everything that, I've, that I personally have been able to contribute and that Save the Crew as, a, as an organization, as a team of humans has, has accomplished and what we've done and just the breadth of projects that we've produced. And, uh, you know, I'll let them say what's, what's the rest. Crew fans had given blood, sweat, and tears to save their team. But all they could do now was watch events in Austin and hope. <laughs>